Right, we're going to go through a quick run through of the weekly S&P 500 chart storm. Starting off with the first one, and it's been the same for the last three weeks, it is the trend line and the moving average. Now, even if you ignore this 200 day moving average, which is a, sort of a moving target, there is a, you know, you could easily draw a line around the 2575 line, um, line there and uh, you'd be looking at an ascending triangle. Or a descending triangle rather and um, yeah it remains a sort of uh, push and pull tug of war between the bulls and the bears uh, you know established uh, selling um, clear selling pressure as soon as it approaches that um, downtrend line and um, clear buying support uh, both at the 200 day moving average and um, also at that 2575 level and uh, you know it's getting too crunch time for this one um, pretty sure that we're going to see something give either way pretty shortly second one is a chart showing the S&P 500 in the black and in the blue line that is the Fed's holding of treasuries so back in um, October last year kicked off um, quantitative tightening and so just as a bit of background on that um, that involves the uh, progressive cessation of reinvestment of principal so instead of uh, reinvesting all of the proceeds from maturing bonds into uh, new, new treasury securities and new ABS uh, the, the Fed has embarked on a program where it is going to progressively uh, increase the cap by where it will not reinvest their proceeds. So at the moment, I believe it's 30 billion in total, and that's um, 20 and no, 18 and 12, I think it is, yes. And um, what it's going to ultimately end up is in October this year, if, if it all goes to plan, it will be a pace of uh, 30 billion in treasuries per month and 20 billion in asset backed securities. So you know from October it's going to be actually quite a material pace of uh, decline and pace of you know basically tapering um, you know not doing those purchases anymore and uh, to put that into context QE3 or QE infinity as it was called at the time um, that was about 85 billion a month so you know it's a material amount and you know it was quite popular to throw those charts around while QE was in full swing, we had the Fed holdings of the Treasury's Fed balance sheet going up alongside the market going up. And um, sure enough, we're going to start to see charts like this one that I put together where you have uh, the market sort of, um, you know, coming into a period of greater volatility as the Fed shrinks its balance sheet, which, um, you know, if quantitative easing was a tailwind, and it, and it certainly was, uh, then quantitative tightening should, um, at the margin, be a headwind as well. So, you know, probably a key piece of uh, bearish information on this one. Next one, um, on the bullish side, this is showing the proportion of companies that are beating estimates um, so you know at reporting season did they uh, come in and expectations or did they beat consensus expectations and uh, this pretty high number there and it's interesting though there seems to be this trend there um, either analysts are getting worse at uh, estimating the, um, the earnings or companies are getting better at uh, you know playing or gaming um, expectations downwards and um, you know because you know, the incentive there is that if you beat expectations then you know that tends to be a positive surprise positive surprise usually helps the stock price but anyway um, 80 percent just over 80 percent uh, companies beat, beat the estimates uh, which is pretty good and um, you know it's always a bit of a question as to whether it's you know quite unquote too good um, remains to be seen but it but if you look at earnings estimates so moving into the next one not only were there that many that were beating expectations but if you look at the direction of expectations um, they've been tracking upwards and certainly if you look at this one here showing the long-term estimated average growth rate for the S&P 500 you know that's almost at uh, dot-com euphoria types of levels 
it was helped up initially by the reflation and then by the tax cuts. You know, I look at this one and I talked about this in the write up on the blog where, uh, you know, it looks to be almost more of a uh, type of sentiment indicator than anything. You know, extreme bullish sentiment during the dot com boom and then uh, extreme bearish sentiment, bearish outlook on long term earnings growth during the Great Recession and that whole secular stagnation buzzword that was thrown around in 2015 16. So a word of caution there, I mean, you know, yeah, it looks pretty good, but maybe just a little bit too good. On to uh, something completely different. This chart here shows in the green um, the average over the last couple of years um, versus the previous couple of years or back in uh, 28, uh, well, 10 years ago, actually. And it just shows you uh, the incidence or the, the amount of chatter in earnings calls on ESG terms, so environment, social governance. And uh, it makes sense that companies are talking about this more. I mean, you know, not only are investors actually more focused on that, you know, certainly a trend on the investor side. And, you know, um, at the end of the day, the companies are beholden to their investors. If they, if the investors care about a certain thing, then the companies have to respond to that. And, um, you know, I think there is growing acceptance that the ESG factors uh, can be actually quite beneficial. It's like, it's not just a, you know, nice feeling, warm and fuzzy feelings thing. It's um, it's a pretty important f uh, aspect of the, of, you know, of, more, of a more holistic analysis of a company. So, you know, for example, if a company has really poor ESG practices, then that's probably going to show through sooner or later in, you know, brand or marketing or just scandals, downside risks. Um, and, uh, you know, if anything, it's a good way to uh, identify potential downside risks. So, you know, look beyond those uh, balance sheets, look beyond those financial statements. Now, the next couple of charts uh, kind of take their lead from this one. It's the annual number of IPOs in America. And you can see here, the reason why this chart's interesting is there's a big change from the 80s and 90s where IPOs were booming, you know, oftentimes more than 500 IPOs per year. And um, then you look at the last 10, 10 or so years and, you know, it really gets above 300. It's more around 200 a year. And, it's, um, you know, it's quite a notable shift there. So, you know, ask the question, where have all the IPOs gone? I thought this chart was kind of interesting, kind of related was, uh, so in the blue line here, with the number of US or domestic equity investment funds, and this is uh, across mutual funds, exchange traded funds, and closed end funds, and the number of listed companies. And, you know, you can see there that the number of funds have gone up four times and number of listed companies is almost halved. You could stretch, um, we could sort of point, make the argument or the case that this may have something to do with the lack of IPOs. So, you know, investors, you know, one implication of this chart is that investors are either choosing or being forced to go more into investment funds rather than into picking individual stocks themselves. So, you know, in terms of uh, companies raising capital, going to market to raise capital in the retail market, you know, maybe there's actually less opportunity to do that these days with this kind of trend going on. Maybe, anyway, something to think about. But of course, this one here is a rather interesting one, and um, it may also help explain because, you know, part of uh, having a healthy IPO market, you actually have to have a healthy startup ecosystem or healthy startup uh, numbers. So, you know, if you think about the pipeline for IPOs, you basically want to have a lot of startups, um, you know, being formed because, you know, the more startups you have, if only a certain percentage are ever going to go to an IPO, then, you know, it just goes, stands to reason that if you have this kind of trend that we're seeing here of the startup rate declining over the years, and that could actually have quite an impact on the ultimate number of IPOs. 
But the last one, probably important of all, is a bit of the compare and contrast. So you look at the number of firms, the total number of firms, and note that that's um, counted in the millions, that's on the right hand side, and the number of listed companies, and that's just thousands there um, on the left hand. So, so a way different scale, but it's more important is the trend. So the trend in the total number of firms is uh, being that it's basically just trended more or less up throughout the period, slight dip down below, and you know still somewhat below trend in the wake of the financial crisis, Great Recession. But basically, what we're seeing here in these divergent trends is that there's clearly a preference for to either go private or stay private, and. You know, a big part of that's obviously the change in regulations. It's now, you know, compared to back in the 80s, 90s, it's um, a lot more regulatory scrutiny, regulatory cost, regulatory burden of uh, being a public company. And, um, you know, at, and so that's on the supply side, but on the demand side, I guess, also that, you know, private equity investing has become much more mainstream these days. And, you know, certainly in the last sort of 10, 10 to 20 years, as um, is, is you've seen a lot of asset allocators, you know, begin private equity allocation programs, and and part of that is just you know, a, um, and certainly actually in the last 10 years too, just uh, you know, there's been a lot of interest in alternatives in general, and you know, private equity is a big part of the alternatives market, and you know, one attraction of that is the um, that you don't have the same kind of volatility because you have a lower frequency of mark to market. Um, you know, you can argue whether that is a fair representation of actual volatility or actual risk, but you know, basically it gives you on the face of it a better risk return or risk versus reward um, payoff uh, profile. And um, yeah, there's also the liquidity premium. Um, but I wonder how much of that is still left in the system. Anyway, key point there is that um, we have seen this, this trend and uh, whatever you describe as the reason for it, here it is, it exists. So, you know, between um, the preference to stay or go private, uh, the lower number of startups and um, the crowding out potentially by um, investment funds, and the other thing that I mentioned actually in that article there, the five curious charts on the corporate America and the decline of the IPO, the other thing I mentioned in there was um, actually we've seen in the 90s there was a boom in foreign companies listing on the American Stock Exchange and um, in years subsequent that the, the number of foreign companies listing has actually declined quite uh, materially. So there's a quite a a range of factors um, actually contributing to that and um, certainly create uh, makes for a, a changing investor landscape investment landscape but anyway uh, wrapping up and uh, f leaving off on where we started that um, that push and pull that sort of trench warfare bef between the bulls and bears continues and uh, you know probably going to see resolution of that in short order and um, as I said in the in the write-up you know which way that breaks if the break is um, you know fairly clean and um, clear then it's probably going to be the thing that sets the tone in the weeks ahead and in certainly in terms of the direction of the market overall so watch this space <laughs>